So my name is Raphael Cassier. I'm the chair of the Audio Engineering Society South German section, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this event. If you're interested in joining the AES or joining the section events or being notified about upcoming events, there are some QR codes uh, scrolling around right now. We can put them on at the end of the um, presentation and they're actually also available if you just search for the AES South German section uh, in Google and find our pages on the AES. Um, so without further ado, I will invite Elena Schabellina, who is in charge of organizing the colloquia to say a few words and introduce our speaker. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Rafael, for the introduction. It's really nice to see you all here. And especially for those of you who have not joined any of our colloquia before, uh, we are running a series of colloquia uh, aiming to have one one per month and the goal of this is to provide a platform for both the industry and the academia um, to present their work and to interact and especially to be able to ask questions if the field that is being presented is not your own so unlike a usual conference setting we would like to encourage you to ask questions even if you think it's silly and everyone else knows that it's usually not the case say so, um uh, for how today's event is structured now, we will have a half an hour presentation, uh, which is being recorded. And after that, after that, we will move to another Zoom meeting where everybody will be able to have their cameras on and the Q&A will be live there. So there you can switch your camera on, unmute yourself and talk to the presenter and to each other. I will post the link to that meeting in the chat. So be sure to copy it at the end of the presentation. I'll say it again at the very end. And now I'll introduce, I'll introduce our presenter of today. This is Jonathan Sittler. And his topic is from algorithmic to neural beamforming, two approaches to multi-channel speech separation in pro audio. This is his PhD topic. And uh, Jonathan is a PhD student as the Wilhelm Schickshardt Institute of Visual Computing at the Eberhard Karls University in Tübingen. He's focusing on deep learning and audio signal processing. He received his degree in physics from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and in the past five years he has completed two large research projects at the Institute of Applied Artificial Intelligence at the Stuttgart Media University, closely collaborating with industry leaders in microphone and console design. In 2020, he joined the console manufacturer LAVO as a machine learning engineer, working on model optimization for real-time applications. He has more than 14 years of experience as a musician and producer, and ran a small recording studio for over 10 years. So now I hand over to Jonathan. We are switching our cameras on and preparing for off and preparing for 30 minutes presentation. Okay, Jonathan, the stage is yours. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. So as mentioned, uh, the topic is from algorithmic to neural beamforming. I'm Jonathan Ziegler, and I'm very much looking forward to spending this time with you. And uh, I'm also very curious to hear your input and your questions later on. So generally, when you talk about beamforming, you're talking about the process of manipulating and combining signals of multiple sensors or transducers within an array to generate some form of enhanced array signal output. As you can see by these images, I will be focusing on microphone array beamforming. On the left, you can see a compact coincident microphone array with a clearly defined fixed number of microphone capsules, which have a clearly defined fixed relative position to each other. On the other side, you can see a large aperture spaced array with multiple microphones, which are spaced over a very large distance. In this case, you can't be completely sure of the absolute positions of the microphones. A ball could hit an individual uh, stand and, and knock it over. Somebody could have mounted the wrong microphone at the wrong position, et cetera. I tackled both ends of this spectrum from different approaches. So for the coincident microphone array, we chose an algorithmic beamforming approach. And for the large aperture spaced array, we chose a deep learning based uh, data driven approach. So obviously, both ends of the spectrum require a certain set of knowledge. So um, 
I will try to cover as much on the signal processing and the machine learning aspects as possible. If there's any, any open questions, feel free to ask later. So let's start um, with uh, the coincident beamforming. I'll be talking about uh, the process of gradient synthesis. I'll introduce the algorithm and array designs, and we'll be talking about the results, and I can show some audio examples as well. For the neural beamforming, I'll be introducing the signal model. Then I'll talk about the neural network architecture in detail before presenting some results and, again, audio examples. So let's start with con uh, coincident beamforming. In this case, our goal is to create a, a single microphone beam with excellent quality that can be directed at any angle. The way we do this is we combine omnidirectional and bidirectional microphones to create this first order beamformer. On the right hand, you can see this um, overlay of three microphone polar plots. The green line indicates the omnidirectional microphone, which is equally sensitive in all directions. And the red and the blue are the two figure of eight or bidirectional microphones with their clear defined rejection areas where the microphone is much less sensitive than from the, uh, the target directions. The first phenomenon we use is that if you combine a closely spaced omnidirectional and figure of eight microphone, you can just by varying this polar parameter P create any desired first order uh, polarity pattern that you want. So as you can see on the right, this is the synthesis of the combination of these two virtual microphones. And um, the only thing that we're manipulating is this polar parameter P. The second step is that if you can combine two coincident orthogonally placed figure of eight microphones, you can create a virtual rotated figure of eight that is on the plane that these two microphones spanned. <clears throat> so by combining these two effects, we can now synthesize any first order microphone beam aimed at any direction on this horizontal plane spanned by these two figure of eight microphones. So this is essentially the first step to create our beam former. We now have the ability to aim our beam at any direction we want. The second part is finding out which direction we actually want to aim it at. For this, we need some sort of acoustic source localization method. We chose the energy-based acoustic source localization. Uh, the way that works is that we synthesize virtual cardioid capsules aimed at every direction on this horizontal plane. So we created 360 individual virtual cardioid microphones spaced at a one degree resolution. Then we take these signals of these 360 virtual microphones and compute the energy of each of these signals. So we take the RMS of each of these individual microphones and look at the energy for the current audio buffer. What you can see on the right are not uh, microphone polarity, uh, not microphone polar patterns like the pictures I, sh I showed you earlier. These are actually the RMS values of these 360 individual capsules. And um, logically, you can see that the microphone containing the highest energy is most likely to be the microphone that is aimed at our acoustic source. If you take such a rudimentary acoustic source localization algorithm, you'll get a tracking performance that looks something like this. So what we see here is a, an acoustic scene with four individual speakers. You have quick jumps between the speakers and fairly static positions where nobody's moving and only one person is talking in between. That's indicated by the red lines. The black dots indicate the positional output that our acoustic source localization algorithm predicted. If we would use this to feed a beamformer, these rapid jumps between the individual time steps would be clearly audible and we would get some pretty nasty artifacts in the audio. To counteract that, we decided to implement an exponential smoothing algorithm. The way that works is that for any time step t, the output of the smoothing algorithm is a combination of the actual me measurement of that time step t and the smoother's output of the previous time step. And depending on how you set alpha, somewhere between 0 and 1, you can create a very reactive tracking or a very stable tracking. The problem is, if we set alpha small enough to get a sufficiently stable tracking, it wouldn't be reactive enough anymore to, to accommodate these quick jumps between speakers anymore. The solution to this is to, to set alpha dynamically per time step and make that dependent on the directional quality of the buffer. So in other words, how, how confident are we that this time step contains actual valuable 
positional information that we will use to adapt, uh, adjust the uh, tracker's direction. This process we called uh, confidence weighting with uh, a few different factors that we called the confidence indices. And taking all these smoothing methods together, you can get from this very noisy directional output to something that looks more like this, where you can still have these rapid changes in a few milliseconds. This uh, tracker is capable of jumping between individual speakers, but it's still stable enough that we can feed a, um, a beamformer with this positional information. So let's look at the first and most important confidence weighting mechanism that we used, and that's the directivity weighting. Essentially, the way that works is that we sample the, di di uh, the directivity of the sound field and compare it to a perfect unidirectional distribution. So what would a sound source coming from one clear direction in an anechoic room look like? And we compare the current time step with this uni um, unidirectional distribution. And as you can see, the first, the top image, is much closer to what we would expect from a unidirectional distribution than the bottom one, which has much more diffuse energy coming from the back and the sides. And so the smoothing algorithm outputs uh, a position which is far from the current maximum, but is more likely to be accurate as this was a high, a high confidence output of the previous time step. The second method implied is the long-term weighting. This is the same acoustic scene that you saw on the image earlier. In this case, we're looking at the synthesized supercardioid and the way it is tracking these sources. And the motivation behind this is that generally in an acoustic scene, you will have some sort of quasi-static positions. Either you'll have a source that moves fairly slowly, or you have individual sources that will jump uh, where, the, where the action will be jumping back and forth. In both cases, it makes sense to learn these static positions and give these directions more confidence. So if somebody has been speaking for a few minutes at a certain position, the probability that sound coming from that direction is useful is much higher than from a direction that we have not previously detected any valuable directional information. The nice thing about this algorithm is it learns and forgets these quasi-static uh, positions fairly quickly, so it can autonomously uh, adapt to changing situations. The next weighting index that I'd like to introduce was the speech weighting. This was an experiment to see if we can use a small convolutional neural network to predict voice activity. So we fed these, this network with MEL scale spectrograms of the current time step, and the network output a probability that this time step contains speech. A few words on the array design. Some of you in the recording industry might have noticed the image I showed was a Schirps, um double MS array, and that does not contain two figure of eights in an omnidirectional microphone, but rather it contains one figure of eight and two vertical uh, capsules. The nice thing is that a cardioid capsule is, uh, you can consider it's just an overlay of an omnidirectional and a bidirectional signal. And so by adding or subtracting these from each other, you can end up getting exactly the signals that we need. W, X, and Y are omnidirectional and are two bidirectional microphone signals. Next, I'd like to present a few of the results. In this case, we're looking at actual recordings that we did. We pre-recorded dialogue in a semi-anechoic environment, and we did multi-channel recordings of interference noise, construction sites, things that you would hear in an office, and so forth. And we played these back over a 12-channel loudspeaker array in a controlled acoustic environment with defined positions for each loudspeaker. We had two scenes, two dialogues, one in German, one in English. And we recorded the clean dialogue and the one with interference and noise. The metrics you can see here are the mean angular error and the mean correction error. So essentially, what we're looking at is the accuracy of the tracker and the stability. And um, the results we're looking at here are the element of the individual weighting algorithms. So you can see that the raw directivity output um, in the first line has a um, fairly bad accuracy and a very bad stability. And just by adding the directivity weighting, we can, we can greatly improve accuracy and stability right away. 
the long-term method, the long-term waiting method is particularly relevant for noisy environments, which makes sense because here it's, it's of greater value to remember a direction. If for instance, the next time something coming from that direction, you have additional interference from the sides. The third line is the uh, level weighting. That's another, uh, an additional little feature that we added that we say um, any time step containing practically no information. So uh, silent, silent time steps can't really contribute anything of value for our directional information. So these are automatically set to a confidence of zero. That won't improve the accuracy per se, but it does help the stability because in speech pauses, the, the position doesn't just start jumping around and, and listening to structural or, or hardware noise and something like that. I didn't add the speech weighting to this uh, because we did a, a dedicated analysis of the performance of that. And although it did increase the stability, it, it reduced the accuracy somewhat. And uh, considering the high computational cost of adding a convolutional neural network to this, otherwise fairly lean and um, efficient algorithm just didn't, didn't seem cost efficient. So we decided to omit that from the final algorithm. The second set of results you can look at here are from a synthetic data set. So we used um, synthetic room impulse responses to create different sized room environments. So the first category was in the sub 0.05 second uh, reverberation time. So very small recording studio, vocal booths or anechoic chambers. The second with 0.4 to 0.6 uh, seconds is more of a small room, maybe a controlled um, listening environment or a small office space, something like that. And then 0.6 to 1.5 seconds is more, more reverberant environments. These also always correlate with room sizes to a degree. Whenever we recorded the noisy uh, signals, uh, we tried to fix the signal to noise ratio at around six decibels. And here you can see in the, in the error that noise and reverb both have a, a strong detrimental effect to tracking accuracy, obviously, but it's not that one supersedes the other by a lot. So noise is difficult to deal with, but reverberation is, is similarly difficult to deal with. The last two columns you can see here um, are investigating the beam forming capability of this algorithm. So if we combine the positional output with the synthesis of a virtual supercardioid that's fed with this directional information, we can get a uh, signal to distortion ratio improvement of around 3.5 or 3, 3 to 3.5 decibels. What that means is using this system over just placing an omnidirectional microphone at the same position, we get three and a half decibels less interference and reverberation. And if we compare that with a, a super cardio beamformer that actually knows the absolute positions at every any time, you can see that gives us another 0.5 to one decibel gain. But all in all, the, the tracking beamformers uh, performance is pretty close to what an Oracle beamformer can achieve. So I'd like to present a few audio examples real quick. Obviously, uh, I'm not sure what the compression over Zoom will do to this, and I was told it's fairly quiet. So feel free to check out the, compare, uh, the companion page that I set up. You can quickly A-B the, uh, the listening examples, and there's a little bit of information given there as well. So I will now be quiet so you can turn up the volume if need be on your headphones. I'll be playing the first the omnidirectional signal at the position of the, of the microphone array. Then we'll listen to the um, supercardioid using this information. And the third sample is actually a adaptive filtering beamformer developed by a colleague of mine, Benfried Runo, which works exactly with this array and our uh, tracking information. The scene you will hear is actually the scene that you saw in the in the plot and also in the animation earlier. Now, on the St. Louis team, we have who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellows on the St. Louis team. I'm telling you. Who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. You know the fellows' names? Yes. Well, then who's going first? Yes. 
Now, on the St. Louis team, we have who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellows on the St. Louis team. I'm telling you. Who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. You know the fellows' names? Yes. Well, then who's playing first? Yes. I mean the fellows' names. Now, on the St. Louis team, we have who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellows on the St. Louis team. I'm telling you. Who's on first? What's on second? I don't know who's on third. You know the fellow's names? Yes. Well, then who's playing first? Yes. I mean, the fellow's name on... All right, so I, I think it becomes pretty audible that just the transition from the omnidirectional signal to the track supercardioid significantly reduces the reverberance of the scene. And that at with absolutely no artifacts. So I've really listened closely and personally, I was not able to distinguish any kind of processing artifacts from this. The adaptive beamformer does greatly increase uh, speech intelligibility and noise suppression. Again, we also performed some listening tests, they proved that, but at the cost of it sounding slightly processed. So obviously depending on your application for, for something like this and, and teleconferencing, that would be fine. You'd be happy to just have a cleaner signal. But if you want to actually use this for in a, in a recording or in a production, that wouldn't really be acceptable. So as I said, we were in fairly uh, controlled acoustic environments. So something like a lecture, which is also recorded for e-learning, where you have conversations between the students and the lecturer, or something that I'm expecting to see a lot in the next few years, a hybrid conference environment, where you'll have discussions with people in the audience, which have to be picked up in a way that people sitting at home are still able to follow the discussion. And just having people running around with wireless handhelds is just not a very practical application. If you could just take one of these arrays and place it in a corner or maybe two of them and get the same result. Another experiment that we did was this was a, a book reading with an author, which had a live audience, but it was also broadcast live on the radio. And so we just tried to analyze what's the difference if we would use this microphone array compared to the individual close microphones for the speakers and the handhelds for the, for the audience. But in general, I would say the application for this is fairly controlled, not too much noise, and not too big of an acoustic environment, obviously. Um, but this is not always the case. So how do we, how can we transition from something like this to something insanely more complicated on the signal processing side? For instance, this, where you have 80,000 or tens of thousands of people screaming, and you're trying to pick up a specific sound source and enhance that. We quickly realized that um, algorithmic signal processing might be at its limits for something like this. So we decided to go for a machine learning based approach, the neural beamformer. Before I get into the actual network architecture design, I'd like to give a quick refresher on just additive spaced beamforming. Uh, if you have a if you have knowledge over the position of your microphones, mm, no, let me let me start a different way. If a signal arrives from an angle towards the array, you can see that the wavefront will hit the individual microphones at different times. Just geometrically, you'll have different propagation times. And so you'll have a delay be between the individual microphones regarding this wavefront. If you're able to set the delays appropriately to, comp to compensate this, you will get an accentuated version of this signal in the summed combination of the individual array microphones. If you have noise arriving from a different angle, these delays will not be uh, will not be compensated accurately, and this signal will actually be reduced in volume statistically compared to the target wavefront. The question is, how do we set these delays? Well, if you know where your microphones are, exactly know where your microphones are, and you know where your target is coming from, you can just geometrically solve for the distance and then with the speed of sound, you can figure out what delays you wanna set. But if you don't know where your microphones are placed exactly, or you don't know where the target is coming from, you have to use some sort of acoustic source localization approach. Uh, we chose to use generalized cross-correlation. So this is just a slightly more fancy version of cross-correlation where we use the phase transform weighting. And uh, if, you can, if you look at the, the right here, you can see an image of two correlated signals 
and you can see the time delay is indicated quite clearly by that peak. Anybody who's ever had to work with cross correlation will know that this is not the way it will look in the real world. This is actually just white noise, which I added a time shift. So you have perfectly uncorrelated sounds and they produce this beautiful peak. In reality, it is very difficult to accurately track time delays with these uh, cross correlation methods. And um, as soon as you get a decent amount of reverb or noise, this is prone to failure. So let's look at a very simplified situation. We have a target signal S and our um, noise signal N. And these signals propagate through space to our microphones, our reference microphone, and our auxiliary microphone. And as these propagation paths, A through D, are different, the mixtures will be different. So you can see that the uh, signal that the, the mixture that the reference microphone picks up contains much more of the square wave than the sine wave. And the auxiliary microphone contains more of the sine wave than the square wave. But if you look closely, it's not only the level relations, you can also see that the phase relation has changed. Of course, the propagation paths have different lengths, and so the time when the individual signals arrive at the microphones change. Mathematically, this can be uh, expressed as a convolution with the appropriate impulse responses indicated here with the colored H's. So if we were able to find an additional impulse response, which is capable of transforming the aux recording in a way that it would sound like the signal component, the target signal component of this was recorded at the reference microphone, we would be able to sum these two signals up and generate a enhanced beamforming output. So you can see here again, expressed with the convolution, this additional uh, path E would generate the signal as recorded at our reference microphone. As this is computational, computationally quite difficult, we decided to design a neural network model which learns and applies this internally. So let's look at the neural network architecture now. The way this works is we have an end-to-end -end network. So we feed the network with a multi-channel time domain audio input. We have our reference input and a certain number of auxiliary inputs. These are then synchronized using the aligner components of the network. And then a masking network does the actual signal enhancement of the individual channels. And these are then added together to generate our enhanced output. Looking at the aligner, this is uh, split into two phases. The first phase is the pre-filtering phase. Without looking at the image too much yet, um, the way the motivation behind this is we want to filter the audio in a way that is beneficial to the spatial computation. So we're not trying to filter the audio in a way that sounds good for us humans, but we're trying to enhance the audio in a way that produces more dependable cross correlation vectors. The way this is done is we use an encoding block we call encode waveform to generate latent representations of our audio signal. These combined latent representations are then fed to filter blocks that learn to generate appropriate FIR and amplitude filters. And the filtered audio is then passed to the alignment phase where we compute cross correlation and auto correlation of the signals. All this information again is encoded into the same latent space and concatenated with the original latent vector. All this information is then used and passed to a final filter block, which then generates the actual FIR and amplitude filters, which are used to modify the auxiliary input with respect to the reference input. So let's go a little further into this and look at the individual blocks. So the encode waveform uses a gated convolution and a one-dimensional strided convolution for downsampling. Everything in this gray box is looped. So depending on the compression factor we need for the signal length, this is performed a multitude of times before giving our latent vector as an output of the encode waveform. As mentioned, the filter block uses the inverse operation, the generate waveform, and takes these latent vectors to generate either FIR filters 
or I'll say FIR like filters, convoluted filters, or per sample uh, multiplicative masks. If we look at the generate waveform a little closer, it's very similar to the encode waveform. Again, we have this iterative core, um, but in this case, we're not downsampling, we're actually upsampling, and we use transposed one dimensional convolution for this. Again, uh, gated convolution, and we have the residual connections as well. The last part of the architecture is the masking network. As this is fairly well researched, um, or has been in the last few years, we decided to use the state of the art model from the literature for this part. We use the dual path RNN. The way this works is it takes our audio and re uh, chops it up and recombines it into these, these volumes where we have individual chunks of audio. And these are then processed by bidirectional long short-term memory networks, once along the time axis and then along the chunk axis. And we stack this processing to generate sufficient model complexity to actually model the amplitude maps, uh, amplitude masks that we require. A quick word on training and data simulation. We used uh, synthetic room impulse responses again to generate our data. We used speech and noise from public data sets. And our room dimensions this time are much larger. So we synthesized rooms up to 115 meters per dimension. And training was performed using mean square error loss, um, comparing the model output and the target signal as recorded at the reference channel. And we optimized using the Ranger optimization algorithm. Now, just a quick look at some of the results. Uh, in this case, we're looking at four acoustic scenes with the maximum microphone to microphone distance listed up here. Um, each of these acoustic scenes, we're looking at three different mixtures where the signal to noise ratio at the target microphone, uh, at the reference microphone, excuse me, are minus six, zero, and six decibels. And we're comparing uh, four different baseline methods with our neural beam former. The first is applying the uh, the time delays as estimated by the GCC FAT algorithm, and then using delay and sum beam forming. The second is delay and sum beam forming using Oracle uh, time delays. The third is a single channel dual path RNN on the reference channel. The fourth is using the GCC FAT delay and sum beam forming, and then passing it to a single channel DPRNN. And the last one is using the aligner configuration and passing it to a multi-channel DPRNN. And as you can see, except for the simplest acoustic environment, so the highest signal to noise ratio in the smallest room, our neural beamformer outperformed the baselines by sometimes a quite significant margin. Here, I'd like to give you some audio examples as well. This is... Um, a scene that we used uh, for, well, we, we trained on different, on different uh, classes of audio, and this was the large scale sporting venue. So we're gonna hear the reference microphone, then I will play the single channel DPRNN output, and then you will hear the neural beamformer output. Bada, ein Unentschieden. Heute für Villarreal. Mehr war, er war sehr aktiv in Durchgang 1, hat ja auch den Elfmeter verwandelt. Bader, ein Unentschieden. Heute für Villarreal. Mehr war, er war sehr aktiv in Durchgang 1, hat ja auch den Elfmeter verwandelt. Und hätte für so eine besondere Duell ist ja der Sieg was ganz Besonderes. Bader, ein Unentschieden. Heute für Villarreal. Mehr war, er war sehr aktiv in Durchgang 1, hat ja auch den Elfmeter verwandelt. All right, before concluding, I'd like to just give a quick overview over the contributions we were able to make uh, within these two research projects. On the topic of algorithmic beamforming, we performed two listening tests. We did some work on um, examining spectral subtraction a little more closely. We developed a method for uh, better display of microphone polarity measurements and the required interpolation using spherical harmonics. We presented this survey on the uh, speech weighting algorithm in a dedicated uh, publication. 
and then finally the entire uh, coincident beamforming algorithm was presented in this in this uh, publication. As the neural beamforming uh, project is younger, we had less uh, opportunity to actually produce any publications. We were able to file a patent application last year for the method, and then there's two manuscripts concerning um, the alignment process itself and the entire neural beamformer architecture up here. With this, I would like to conclude my talk and thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention.